when we talk about collective ownership, we are often told that the great thing about it is that everybody will own. The reality of the thing is that nobody but those in power own. The Great Reset is an idea put forward by the World Economic Forum to fundamentally restructure the global economy in the wake of COVID-19. But what are some of the dangers inherent in this ideology? Joining me to discuss is Douglas Kruger, who's a speaker and author focusing on political correctness. Douglas, could you tell our viewers, what is this idea of the Great Reset exactly, and what are some of the risks attached to it? Like many of the politically correct ideas that we, we hear bandied about in the media, uh, this entire project is couched in, in kindness. It is presented as something that is being done or being proposed for our good and for the greater good. And uh, that always uh, sets my, my alarms and sensors going because that tends to, to lead to very problematic ideology. In a very quick nutshell, the proposal out of Davos uh, is essentially this, a group of exceptionally powerful individuals, predominantly in the banking, finance, and business sector, um, in alliance with government leadership, are proposing that as a result of these COVID lockdowns that have done a great deal of damage to economies globally, they perceive that they now have an opportunity to rebuild economies, but to do so in what they believe is a, a more enlightened fashion. And there are generally, generally speaking, there are problems with the idea of groups of people in power deciding the history of humanity. In a best case scenario, we are simply supposed to be free to determine our own futures, our own um, progress, what, what we want out of life. Now, in this particular case, what they're proposing is a sort of collectivist idea that takes personal ownership out of the equation. The little phrase, and it sounds so innocent, is you will own nothing and you will be happy. Now, if you go back just several hundred years, the founding father and first president of the United States, which was a essentially a project founded on the idea of human liberty and freedom, pretty much for the first time in modern history. Uh, George Washington said, there is no such thing as personal human rights without property ownership. And he said that for several very interesting and important reasons. But the principle is sound. If you are dependent on a greater power for everything, then you are not free. You, um, you place yourself as an individual in quite a precarious situation. It was in fact the formula for living, the, the sort of political reality for most of human history. If you look back at um, a simple setup like the serfs of Europe, this is a group of people who owned nothing and simply contributed to the overlord who determined what they could and could not have. And they had zero rights. The, it is the property that you own that actually ensures your rights to a great degree. So while this may sound like a, a very enlightened idea, sort of a communal uh, collectivist utopia, there are many problems with this once you start thinking about how it might actually be implemented. And, and that's what's con what concerns me. So Douglas, is there a risk here that we could see an encroachment of state power into the lives of ordinary individuals and essentially a kind of creeping tyranny that takes hold? Well, economist and historian uh, Dr. Thomas Sowell makes a very interesting point about how humans evaluate political systems. And he says we make the, the terrific mistake of evaluating them based on their kindly sounding intentions before the fact, rather than on their outcomes after the fact. Um, and he, he proposes the idea that our, our world, our politics would look very different if we had to judge each thing that, that politicians and governments try based on the outcomes instead of the intentions. At the intention stage, it is remarkably easy for smooth politicians to stand up and say kindly sounding things. Now, the sorts of things that we're hearing from Davos and from the likes of the proponents of the Great Reset all talk about collectivist and communal living and how nobody will own anything. But now consider for just a second, that is already a fallacy. Someone somewhere has to own. And in fact, what happens is if you take ownership out of the hands of a broad-based populace and of many separate entrepreneurs and families and individuals, and you concentrate it into the hands of, say, a few multinational corporations working together with government, well, firstly, that, that system is by definition fascistic. Uh, this idea of an all powerful government and the businesses that work in conjunction with them. It leads very quickly to 
cronyism to, to the types of corruption that we see, particularly in South Africa, where we are so keen on talking about business and government collaborating. And, and doesn't that just sound like such a good thing, business and government collaborating? What happens there is you have the people who own the rules, enforce right and wrong, and have a financial incentive to be corrupt, working with the people who have the money and have an incentive to corrupt them. It, it's, it's a dreadful formula just to begin with. However, what concerns me is perhaps on a, a bigger scale than that. When we talk about collective ownership, we are often told that the great thing about it is that everybody will own. The reality of the thing is that nobody but those in power own. Um, and that, that impulse to take away private property ownership and to concentrate it into the hands of a representative, uh, representative government is purely Marxist. I mean, it is the heart and soul of the, the Marxist idea, which stripped down to its basics is nobody owns property, it is collectively owned. Uh, and as I say, of course, the fallacy there is that it is not actually collectively owned, it is owned by those in power. Now, what can go wrong with that? Well, if we look at modern day China, we get a very good example of this one. Um, modern day China, of course, a bit of a mixed economy. They have prospered to the degree that they've started permitting free trade. However, they are still very much a Marxist society. And they work according to social credit scores. And social credit scores imposed by law represent a very chilling idea. Now imagine this, for example, you as a family do not own your home, you do not own what is around you, uh, you do not own your business, the government has absolute control because they are the representative of collective ownership. Now imagine a scenario in which you do something that the government does not approve of. You read a book that it doesn't want you to read. You write an essay or an article that it doesn't like. You create a, a, a YouTube video commenting on something in a negative way. Now those are all things that productive human, human beings do to critique and build and grow their society. But you can't do it there. And if you do something that the government disapproves of, using these social credit scores, they can ghost you. They can effectively lock you out of your world. And it works because you don't own anything. It is that ownership, that broad-based private ownership, that keeps people free from government tyranny. Uh, Maggie Thatcher from, uh, from the UK very famously embarked on a project to expand human liberty in her nation by trying to ensure as much broad-based private and individual ownership of property as possible. In that, she was in agreement with George Washington, who said that it is property rights that prop up human freedom. You can go into great depth and philosophy on this one. You, you can even take property rights down to the level of your thoughts. Are you free to own them? Are you free to express them? Or is the realm of thinking controlled by a collective? Now, of course, all that sounds, uh, I mean, it sounds like terrible fear mongering. But of course, the question for anyone who looks back over history is to ask, could it happen here? Could it happen again? And I think if you do know your history, the answer is it happens surprisingly easily and it happens surprisingly often. When communities play with this idea of collectivist ownership, I would argue that it happens 100% of the time. And that when we're talking about collective ownership um, and the elevating of the group over the sanctity of the individual, we are dealing with a formula that has been deeply damaging to the human species. So Douglas, what about the threats to the property that we already own? Is there a risk there that we might lose our ownership over our existing property? Ah, David, that's an excellent question. And it's one that I think people are not considering. Now, think again of those words. You will own nothing and you will be happy. It, it doesn't allow for a, you will continue to own what your family has bequeathed down the generations. The, the simple statement, if we are to take them at their word, is you will own nothing and you will be happy. Now, that, that poses some fascinating problems in terms of what communities already own. We largely around the world, we own our homes. We bequeath um, heirlooms, family heirlooms to the next generation. You might own a wedding ring. You might own uh, things that you want to give on to your children. And I would argue that that is one of the very best things that we do. Each generation tries to uplift the next generation. This philosophy seems to be saying, instead of doing that, we reset each generation at zero and leave you dependent on a government welfare system. Now, from, from the most 
basic human perspective, that strikes me as deeply unhealthy. If the best thing we do is to raise up our children and help them to go further than us, then starting at zero with government dependency every generation, it strikes me as a bit of a chilling idea. Um, if you look at basic stats, human stats, around groups of people living on welfare, you will find that you have disproportionate rates of marital breakup, of family breakup, of alcohol and drug abuse, and of interpersonal violence. The stats are way different uh, to people who are self-sufficient, self-sustaining, employed or running their own businesses. So one of the things that I think people are not considering here is under a paradigm in which nobody owns anything, we all become a group of people living under the welfare state. And it seems to me that that is a very good way to do damage to the health and to the psyche of human beings. We don't seem to prosper under such conditions. I concede very readily that we have to help the poor and the, and the struggling among us. There, I mean, that is a that is a Christian, a Judeo-Christian principle. Uh, it has built been built into Western classical thinking for a very long time. But a welfare state in which you don't do anything, but you live dependent on the government, seems to cause human beings to rot. I don't think it's a healthy scenario. We're proposing it on a global scale. Well, thanks very much, Douglas. I think it's important that we interrogate the dominant narratives that are emerging from global institutions like the World Economic Forum, and to ask ourselves, who are these narratives serving exactly? My name is David Ansara. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel for updates from the CRA team every weekday morning. Please do also let us know what you think in the comments section below. Is there a sinister motive behind this idea of the Great Reset, or is that just a conspiracy theory?